I met, the first time I met Senator Rubio, actually it wasn't a senator at the time, but it was at a quarterly meeting of the Republican Party of Florida held up in Orlando a few years back. He was about to challenge uh, then Republican Governor Charlie Crist for the uh, primary for the United States Senate. I had the opportunity to go to his suite where I met his lovely wife Jeanette and had a conversation with the, uh, with the future, with the senator and felt very, very comfortable uh, when I left there knowing that this was a true patriot and a man who was doomed, destined to go places in this country. Here, here. His, uh, his lovely wife offered me some Cuban coffee and I think I had two or three cups of it. And uh, after our evening, I went back to my room and I was ready to call the desk and say, uh, do you have any paint? Because I could paint the room. There's no way I'm gonna get any sleep tonight. So, uh, in any event, this desk, as the story goes on, well, let me introduce the, uh, the Senator. Senator Rubio served in the Florida House of Representatives from 2000 to 2008 and was elected to the United States Senate in 2010. Congratulations. His senatorial committees uh, to date include commerce, science and transportation, foreign relations, intelligence, and small business and entrepreneurship. He lives in West Miami with his beautiful wife, Jeanette, and their four children. Please join me in welcoming United States Senator, our own Marco Rubio. Chairman for what you're doing and all of you for what you're doing to help build the party and make it stronger here not just locally but across the state. We have a lot of work to do. As uh, as you may have read, there is a technological gap between us and the Democrats, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm joking. I joke. Anyway, we look forward to it. So thank you so much. Dr. West, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, I do want to see that video. We miss Alan West very much in Washington, but I know he's... But what we do know is that God has a plan for all of us, and God has a plan for Alan West, and we're all excited to see what that is. And, uh, here, here. Now, let me first say, I'm always honored to speak at Lincoln Day Dinners. I'm honored to speak to what it means for our party. One time a year we get together at the local level, and examine what it means to be a Republican and what it means to be involved in politics. So maybe what I'd like to do for a few moments tonight is speak to you in the aftermath of an election that disappointed many of us. The truth is, at this time last year, if you would have told me that we were going to lose the election, I wouldn't have believed it. Given the direction the country was going, given the way things were happening in our country, you ask yourself, there's no way, we don't know who the nominee is going to be, but we're pretty sure we're going to win this thing. Well, it didn't turn out that way. And Obviously, there are technical reasons why, there are, there are logistical reasons why, and all those things I leave to the experts on that stuff. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about what the Republican Party, I hope, will be. Because let me tell you the danger in politics. The danger in politics is if you do not define yourself, if you don't tell people what you stand for and who you are, your opponents will do it for you. And what they will say about you almost never is true. And so it is important for us to clearly define what it means to be a conservative Republican in the 21st century. Last night I had an opportunity to be in Pasco County, where I spoke at a Reagan Day dinner. And I think one of the things that I know and admire about Ronald Reagan is that when Ronald Reagan was the president, you understood what it meant to be a conservative Republican. That's right. Yeah. Because he defined it in action, war, and deed. Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, confronted the issues of the 1980s by applying conservative, time-tested conservative principles to the challenge of that time. And the result is that an entire generation of Americans, myself a part of it, grew up in that era, inspired by his leadership and forever shaped by the positions that he took for both our country and the world. It is not a coincidence that across the political spectrum, the Republican Party has an overabundance of people in their 40s and 50s who are conservative leaders on a national level. Scott Walker in Wisconsin, Paul Ryan in Wisconsin, Ted Cruz from Texas, Rand Paul from Kentucky, Mike Lee from Utah, and others. 
It is not a coincidence because we all have one thing in common. We grew up with Ronald Reagan in the White House. Yeah, yeah. Now, we live in a different era where the challenges, although somewhat similar, are different. That doesn't mean we have to change our principles. Our principles still work. What it means is that those principles need to be applied to the challenges of this new century, to a world that looks different from 1980. That doesn't mean you abandon your principles. That means you apply them. That's right. You apply them to the challenges of the time in which you live. Amen. And the challenge that we have as Republicans is to apply those principles in a way that speaks to the lives of real people, that lets them understand what it means to be a conservative and what it means to be a Republican. And it should mean a lot of different things. But I want to focus on three tonight that I think are very important. The first is, when people think of Republicans, they should think of us as the party of upward mobility. Not the party just of people who have made it. We have nothing against people who have made it. If you are successful economically, if you are successful professionally, we celebrate it. We hold you up as an example and an inspiration. But for the most part, if you have made it, all you want government to do is basically leave you alone so you can continue to make it and help others make it too. But we're also the party of people that are trying to make it. And our argument is, look around the world. Look at places where the government dominates the economy. Look at places where the government does the kinds of things that this president and the Democratic Party and the left wants our government to do, or in fact, are trying to make our government do. And what you will find is stagnant economies. You look around the world at places where government dominates the economy, and you will find stagnant economies where the same people keep winning and everybody else is stuck working for them forever. You will find places where your future is determined on the day you are born. You can only be what your parents were. You can only go as far as your family went before you. You are limited by the circumstances of your birth. That is a fact. In fact, that is the rule, not the exception in human history. But America has been different. Because here, we embraced free enterprise and limited government. And because we did, we have achieved a level of upward mobility unequaled, unparalleled, in the history of all mankind. And so tonight, as we examine what it means to be a Republican, let me tell you what it means. It means we celebrate those who have succeeded and want them to continue to succeed. But we are the party of people who today are workers, but one day want to be owners. We are the party of employees that one day aspire to be employers. We are the party of people that want to start businesses out of the spare bedroom of their home. Yes, in violation of the zoning code, but we are the party. We are, we are the party. We are the party of people that with a laptop and the empty table at a Starbucks just started America's newest business and one day we'll employ 20, 30, 40, and 50 people. Amen. We are the party of the young people that are working here tonight serving us, who are working here so they can pay their way through college or provide for their families at home, who one day aspire to be something more than what they are today. We are that party too. And our policies reflect that necessity and that reality. And so when we talk about being against higher taxes, it's not because we want to help people have to pay less taxes for the sake of it. It's because we understand that every penny that goes to the government in taxes is money that's not available to circulate in the private economy. When we talk about when we talk about getting a hold of regulations, it's not because we want the air to be dirty or the water to be unclean. I love water. It's because we understand that if regulations get too expensive, Big companies might be able to comply, but not the guy or gal starting a business out of the spare bedroom of their home. It's the reason why we want to repeal Obamacare. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because if you're a big corporation with a massive human resources department, you may not like Obamacare, but you can afford to deal with it. You can hire the best law firm. You can hire the best lawyers, you can hire the best accountants, and ultimately they will help you figure it out, and you will do what you need to to stay in business. But what about the small businessman or woman? What about the paving company I met in Miami? They don't even realize that Obamacare is around the corner. They have no idea that their 55-person company is on the verge of a devastating development. 
They have no idea the costs that lie ahead. What about the seniors, who this October will get a letter informing them of the benefits they are losing under Medicare Advantage because the money is being taken out and used to pay for something else in Obamacare? Right. What about them? These are the consequences of this program. Do we have a health insurance problem in America? We do. But this is not the way to solve it. The way to solve it, the way to solve it is to give every single American the opportunity to buy the health plan that they want at a price they can afford from any company that will sell it to them, no matter what state that they're in. That's the solution. talk about upward mobility, that's why we keep talking about the national debt. People think the national debt is this thing off in the future somewhere. It's a problem in 20 years. It's a problem in 30 years. And it is. But it's also a problem now. The national debt is hurting us right now. There are jobs in America that are not being created right now because of the national debt. There are businesses that are not opening up in America right now because of the national debt. The reason is, every penny that goes to the government in debt is money that's not available to spend or invest in the business that employs you or the business that you're trying to start. Because the uncertainty, you owe $17 trillion. You borrow 41 to 42 cents out of every dollar that you spend. And you have no plan to deal with it and no political courage to deal with it in your political branches. We are not going to invest in an economy like that. That's the message that we get from the business community. And so the result is no one's investing in the future. Companies are not expanding. They're not investing in new equipment. They're not hiring new workers. They're not expanding into new lines of business because they are afraid of tomorrow. Because tomorrow is full of debt and no plan to address it. The national debt isn't some philosophical belief that's off in the future. It is hurting us now and it only gets worse. We don't like to scold people. We're not the party of accountants that scolds people for spending too much. The debt is hurting our economic growth and upward mobility right now. The second thing that I would say to you about the Republican Party is we're the party of national security. And there is no more important function to the federal government than national security. And I want to explain something to you about what that means in the 21st century. It means a couple of things. It means a lot of things, but there are two I want to focus on. The first is there are still state actors that are dangerous to us. Iran's nuclear ambitions go beyond just a country that wants nuclear weapons. Iran wants to become the dominant power in the Gulf region. They are investing in missile technology and in small, fast boats for the sheer purpose of being able to inflict maximum pain on the U.S. Navy in that region. Their goal is to run us out of the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, so that they can control the Straits of Hormuz. And when they can do, they control billions of barrels of oil a day. You want to bring the world economy to its knees? You want to empower a country to be able to do that? You turn over the Persian Gulf to Iran. And what they're investing in is the ability to drive us out of the Gulf region. So as much as anything else, the reason why we should care about Iran and the Middle East is that their intentions are clear. They want to become a hegemonic power in that region, and not just at our expense, but at the expense of the world. And there's only one nation on earth capable of stopping that from happening. And that's the United States of America. Yeah, yeah. We face a second threat. And that's radical Islamic Jihad. Yes. And it is real. And it exists all over the world. And yes, it is people that are hiding out in mountains, plotting attacks against us here in the homeland, and our interests around the planet. And increasingly, and unfortunately, it appears to also be people living here among us, who become radicalized living here among us. Obama. Just like we will never be the same after 9-11, we will never be the same after Boston. This war against radical Islamic terrorism may last for the rest of our lifetimes and unfortunately maybe even our children. It is that long and we have got to be committed to winning. Because there is still evil in the world and evil must be defeated. And the United States of America remains the only country on earth with the ability and the willingness to call evil for what it is, confront it, and defeat it. Now that doesn't mean we're looking for countries to invade. It doesn't mean we go around the world looking for civil wars to get involved in. It doesn't mean we can solve every crisis and every problem on the planet. It doesn't mean any of that. But I'm just telling you, there's nothing in the world to replace us. The United Nations can't do it. I promise you it can't. No. China can't do it. Russia's not going to do it. In the absence of American leadership, there's chaos. 
And when there's chaos, that's where evil flourishes. That's where it spreads. And that's where it eventually comes to visit us. We should never give up. We should not look for unnecessary conflicts to be involved in. Like I said, America can't be involved in every war. But we cannot give up the mantle of national security. Because all these conflicts that are happening around the world, if we don't solve them there, one day they will find themselves here. And then we will have to deal with them. And so I hope we will always be the party of national security. Beyond all these things, we always hope that we will be the alternative. Not just the opposition. Now we are clearly opposed to the direction that Barack Obama and the Democrats are taking the country. But we're not just opposed to the direction they're taking us. We actually have a better alternative in the direction that they're taking us. You ask us, what's the solution to our debt problem? The solution is not raising taxes. There's no tax increase in the world that can lower our debt. <laughs> if you took every penny away from every millionaire in America next year, you would fund about 60 days worth of government. Yep. There is no tax increase that will solve our debt. By the way, there's no way to just cut our way out of it. We definitely have to have cuts. But you can't just cut your way out of it either. There's only one solution to our debt problem, and that's growth. Grow our economy dynamically and hold the line on spending in the future. If we can grow our economy at 4 to 5% a year, which is the average for America, you would generate trillions of dollars in new revenue that you can use to pay down the debt and lower taxes for people. That's our alternative. Not the false choice of raising taxes. Our alternative is growth. We are the party of growth. There is a health insurance crisis in America. The solution is not a one-size-fits-all big government program. The solution is to empower each and every individual American to do what I outlined earlier. To use their own money, the way their employees use it, their employers use it for them, to buy any insurance plan in America that is willing to sell to them. For each of these problems that face our country, we have a solution. Which, by the way, this focus on being part of a solution is the reason why I've taken on this difficult issue of immigration. And I want to talk to you for a moment about that issue in particular. Because I want, we need to first understand what we have today. What we have right now. What we have right now is a disaster. What we have right now is a legal immigration system that is broken. If we didn't have a single illegal immigrant in the United States, we would still need to do immigration reform. And I'll tell you why. Number one, it's based on the 19th century. Our immigration system is built on, is on whether you know someone who lives here. If you have a family member in the U.S., your chances of coming are pretty good. If you don't, but you have great skills and talent, it doesn't matter as much. That's wrong. Our immigration system should be built on people's skills and merit and talent and what they can contribute to our economy and to our future. That needs to be reformed. So even if we didn't have an illegal immigration problem, we still have to reform it. We have a second problem with our immigration system, and it's probably the highest hurdle we face in reforming it. And that is we have immigration laws that are not enforced. So, for example, 40% of the people that are illegally in the United States, 40%, in Florida it's much higher, of the people who are in the United States right now illegally, they overstay their visas. They didn't jump the fence. They came on an airplane, legally. The visa expires and they stay. We have no idea who they are. We have no idea. Because we only track people when they come in. We don't track if they ever leave. So we don't have a running tally of who came and stayed. We just don't know. Years ago, the government said you must do it, but they ignored it. That needs to be changed. And that's why I support a universal entry-exit tracking system. So that every visitor to the U.S. is tracked when they enter and tracked when they leave. And if they don't leave... And if they don't leave, we know in real time. It shows up on a computer screen. So-and-so is one day overstayed, two days overstayed, five days overstayed. There's another reason why people come here illegally. It's because of jobs. And that's why we need an e-verify system that's verifiable and that works. That's why I support Universal e-verify for every business, big and small. And we can do it. We can implement a system that's cost-effective. That, that, that when you hire someone, you'll be able to compare the information that they're offering you with what's online and confirm whether they're legally here or not. That protects immigrants. But that also protects American workers. The greatest challenge, of course, is enforcing the border. And I'll tell you right now, the biggest obstacle we face in that is with the testimony we've had in the last couple months. 
You think it's helpful that the Department of Homeland Security says the border's already secured, we don't need to do anything else? Let me tell you about the border. The border is not an immigration issue alone. It is a national security issue. It is a sovereignty issue. And, and you, no one can tell me that the first country that landed a man on the moon cannot secure the border of the United States with Mexico. Now, what I get back from people is, we don't trust the government to do it. That's a very significant impediment. People don't trust the federal government to do it. They definitely don't trust this administration to do it. But quite frankly, they say Republicans didn't do it either when they were in charge. So what I need to help figure out, and what I hope people will help me figure out, and what we're trying to work to figure out, is what can we do in the law to ensure that it happens once and for all? Because we can do it. We know what works. We just have to figure out a way to ensure that it happens. And not just that it happens. You can't just enforce the border on one day. You not just don't, not only do you have to secure the border, you have to keep it secure. The last point in all this, quite frankly, has been the least controversial. Not for everybody, but for a lot of people. For mo an increasing number of people recognize that what we have in this country is unsustainable. We have 11 million human beings living among us, illegally, in the country, in violation of our immigration laws. We do not know who most of them are. Some of them are paying taxes, but under someone else's name. They drive in our streets without a driver's license, so they have no insurance. They get sick, they go to the hospital. They have children that are born U.S. citizens. This is a fact. It is not my fault, by the way. The decisions, the decisions, the decisions, the decisions that led to that happening were made when I was in ninth grade. The decisions that led to this happening were made when I was in ninth grade. You don't get 11 million people overnight or in the last three or five years. The majority of the people that are here legally have been here longer than a decade. And there are a lot of reasons why they came. The vast majority of them, quite frankly, are good human beings who just want a better life. But they violated the immigration laws of the United States. And every country has a right to have immigration laws and has a right to enforce them. So what do we do? We have, in my opinion, we have three options. The first option I don't think works. And that is to try to round up 11 million people and their children and their spouses and deport them. I don't think that's a realistic approach, and quite frankly, few people advocate for it. The second approach is just to leave it the way it is. And quite frankly, I think that's de facto amnesty. The third approach is to realize most of these people are going to be here for the rest of their lives. We have got to figure out a way to deal with this once and for all and make sure that it never happens again. And that's what I have said. What I have proposed is encourage these folks to come forward. Undergo a background check, under, undergo a national security background check, pay a $2,000 fine, pay an application fee. They don't qualify for Obamacare, they won't qualify for food stamps, they won't qualify for welfare. The only thing they'll qualify for is to work and pay taxes. And, and that's all they'll be able to have for ten and a half years. Now, is all of this perfect? Do I wish? Let me tell you, if it was 2 million people instead of 11, maybe we'd have other options. But the most important thing is to deal with this once and for all. Now, I want to explain to you why I get involved in this issue. Because there are a lot of other issues I'd rather be talking about. To be honest, I'd much rather be focused on the $17 trillion debt. I think that's much more important to our country. I'd, much, I'd be rather focused on simplifying our tax code. I'm more interested in focusing on securing ourselves from a national security perspective, although immigration has components of that. Here's why I got involved in this issue. Because when I came before many of you three years ago to run for office, I didn't just say, send me to Washington so I can give a bunch of speeches and post a bunch of blog posts and go around and raise money for my next re-election. I told you, send me to Washington because I want to make a difference. I want to go to Washington, D.C. and do what I can to pay back this country for the extraordinary blessings that it's bestowed upon me. There are days in the morning early when I walk to the Capitol. I get there pretty early. It's still dark. The Capitol Dome is lit. And I look at that building. I, I can't believe I worked there. It was just a few decades ago that my dad was a bartender working events like this. It wasn't that long ago my mom was a stock clerk at Kmart. Less than half a century ago they came here. They didn't know anybody. They had no money. Fifth grade education. What other country in the world could what we have lived been possible? And I look at that and I say, what I owe the United States of America, I will never be able to repay in one life. There is no way that I will ever be able to give back to this extraordinary place, or to God for that matter. The opportunities that he has given me are my family. But he's given me this chance to serve. And this chance to serve means I am in a unique position 
I don't know how long you'll let me do this, but in a unique position to identify problems that are hurting America and try to solve them. And folks, the only way I know how to solve a problem is to get involved in trying to find a solution. The only way I know to solve a problem is to identify that problem and work to fix it. That's the only way I know how to solve a problem. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I think I have some. And I think that if I put forth some time and energy in this, I can encourage others to come forward with their answers as well. And that's not just for immigration, that's for all of these things. Because I want you to understand that when we talk about what it means to be a Republican, it's not just about winning the next election, it's not just about who's in charge of the government. This is not college football. This is not a sporting event. What's at stake here is so much more important than that. What's at stake here literally is our identity as a nation. I can tell you what our identity has been. It's been exceptional. Almost everyone that has ever lived in the history of the world has lived in a society where they are trapped by the circumstances of their birth. I want you to envision that for a moment. If you've grown up here and lived here your whole life like I have, we have no idea what that means. But here's what it means. It means that on the day you were born, your life is basically decided for you. It means that no matter how talented you are, how hard you're willing to work, how many good ideas you may have, you live in a society that tells you you can't do certain things because of who you are, because of where you come from, because of what your parents did or didn't do. Imagine living in a place like that where deep inside of you burns not just an ambition but an ability to do extraordinary things, but your society tells you you can't because of where you come from. Now, as hard as that may be to imagine, that is the conditions under which most people that have ever lived have lived. You and I are among a small minority of humans that have ever walked the earth, that live in a very different place, that live in a place that actually believes that every single one of us, in fact, everyone on earth, has the right to go as far as their talent and their work. We are... Among a small minority of people who live in a place that believes that that right, that right doesn't come from the Constitution. No, no. It doesn't come from your government. No. It doesn't come from your politicians. Or, it comes from God. It comes from our Creator. And that the very legitimacy of government, that the very legitimacy of our government is built on whether or not it protects and guarantees those rights. That's our identity, and it makes us different from the entire world. And not only does it make us different from the entire world, it has changed the world. It has literally changed the world. But the most important thing America has ever done for this planet is its example. You see, people all over the world can look here and find someone just like them, who is doing here what they were told was impossible in the nation of their birth. No matter where you are on this planet today, you can look to America and draw inspiration not just from our republic, but from our economy. And so now the question before us is whether we're going to continue to be that country, whether we still think that's possible in the 21st century, and whether they openly admit it or not, the policies that this president and this administration and the left and the Democratic Party pursue, they will rob us of this identity. Here, here. What they're asking us to accept is that the economy just can't grow fast enough. And so what we need is a government to divide up a limited economy among us. What they're asking us to accept is the idea that somehow the only way some of us can be better off is if we give government the power to make others worse off. What they're asking us to accept is the belief that the only way that some of you can have more is if you give government the power to make sure that other people have less. But the problem is that's never who we've been. And that is not who we must become. We must continue to be the country, not the one that wants to make poor, rich people poor. We want to make poor people richer. Not the party that's looking to pull anybody down, but the party that's trying to pull everybody up. The party that tells people, no one has to be worse off in order for you to be better off. Here, here. That's what we want our country to be. And that's what our country must remain if it is to remain exceptional. And we are a generation away from either keeping that and building upon it an extraordinary time. I think this country is on the verge, if it does a few things right, of its greatest era ever. I believe well, that we make a few important decisions and we get them right, that our children will grow up to be the most prosperous Americans in our history. But I also believe, but I also believe that if we do not get it right, we will be the first generation of Americans to leave our children worse off. Wow. And that's the, that's the fork Sad. in the road that, on which we stand. Sad.
Those are the two choices before us. The most prosperous Americans ever, or the first generation to inherit a diminished country. And we are never going to be able to choose the road of more prosperity and more freedom and a better future. Unless our principles find a home in this party, and this party finds a home in the majority in Washington, D.C., so that we can turn those principles into reality. And if we do that, if we do that, if we give the vast majority of Americans who believe in limited government, if we give the vast majority of Americans who believe in free enterprise, if we give the vast majority of Americans who know from their own personal history and the history of this country how exceptional this nation is, if we give them a political home, a real political movement that works on behalf of ideas that further those principles, then we will leave our children, what every generation of Americans before us has left theirs, the single greatest nation in the history of all mankind. So thank you and God bless you for the opportunity.